Join me, Whitney Reynolds, as we pay tribute to a life story of a Holocaust survivor. The Respiratory Health Association is a proud supporter of The Whitney Reynolds Show, raising funds and awareness for lung disease research and programs. Hello, I'm Whitney Reynolds, and today we are sitting down with a woman who not only survived the Holocaust, but shares her story of optimism. You're watching The Whitney Reynolds Show. This show is dedicated to preserving the legacy of the Holocaust by honoring the memories of those who were lost and by teaching universal lessons that combat hatred, prejudice, and indifference. Our guest Estelle Laughlin is here to tell us more. Estelle, thank you so much for coming on. It is so important that my generation learns your generation's stories. Well, it's an honor to be on your show. Thank you for having me. What's really exceptional about you when we were looking into your story and having you on the show is you went through a lot of pain. You went in your childhood, you lived a lot of life, yet you're so optimistic and so happy. How have you been able to do that? I think that suffering is part of everyone's life. Everyone experiences loss and rejection. One does not have to turn bitter. One does not have to turn to despair and hatred. Suffering can teach you to be more compassionate, to love more deeply. Did you get some of these values from your early childhood and your family? I, I did, but indirectly. I um, Love is contagious, and I think hate is contagious, and we mustn't forget that. Um, and maybe if we are reminded more often that human beings are capable of great um, cruelty, we will appreciate the value of love that much more. Let's go back to your early years. You were raised in Warsaw. Tell us about how the transformation happened when it went to the Warsaw Ghetto. Well, it was not immediate. There was a lot of talk about war before the war broke out, before Poland was attacked. Um, but Warsaw was held out for four weeks, so the bombs were raining on us for four weeks, and then the Nazis entered uh, Warsaw. And immediately our lives changed beyond recognition. Our once peaceful streets were now patrolled by foreign soldiers. They uh, said that we Jewish people were greedy, yet they came into our homes like common thieves and helped themselves to whatever they wanted to. They uh, cut off uh, electric power. They rationed all food. Um, schools were closed. Books were made illegal. Uh, we had no tra public transportation. We had no telephones. Couldn't reach anyone, even in an emergency. How did your parents describe this transition to you? Did they, did they sit you down and say, kids, we don't know what this looks like, like, or did he tell you it's gonna get really bad? How did your parents set that up? There wasn't much that anyone needed to explain, and our children grow up very quickly. Uh, immediately, almost, uh, we turned into adults. We took on the responsibilities, and we wanted to protect our parents. So once Warsaw completely changed into the Warsaw Ghetto, what did, a day, what did your day look like? Did you have to work? Did you have to not leave your house? What did that? They called, they named the ghetto Totkas in the death box. And they filled the ghetto with Jewish people driven out from surrounding areas. Most people came barefoot without proper clothing, without a penny in their pocket, many of them. The streets were littered with, 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 with dead people. This, this um, suffering 
went on for a long, long time. And, uh, and then in 1942, July 1942, things became even more gruesome. This was the beginning of the Warsaw Ghetto deportations. We had no idea what the deportations meant. And so most people, some people who were destitute uh, were, uh, some Jewish people were forced to write false letters inviting their families to places where they were fed and clad and sheltered. So you can imagine that some very destitute people uh, thought, thought that this would be an improvement. And they, and they sort of marched voluntarily, not knowing that they were marching to their death. Most people, or many people that I know hid. We hid in the most outlandish places. We hid in drawers, we hid in cupboards, we hid in closets, we hid between mattresses and box springs. We could hear in our hiding the stamping of the boots, the, the insults, the shouting, the barking of dogs, the pops of guns, and, and the yammering of our neighbors, of our people, and the patter of their feet as they were being dragged away. And your story didn't end in the ghetto. You you did end up going to a concentration yes. camp. Yes. What was that? Did you get separated from your father? Yes, yes. So uh, when the people came back and they, some of the people who managed to get back told us about these horrific train rides to a place called Treblinka, where our people were guests. Can you imagine a more heinous crime where our people were guests? At that point, uh, the people in the ghetto, by then, a, a very small fragment of the Jewish people were still alive. So the remainder of, the, of the, the handful of the Jewish people in the ghetto organized themselves in armed resistance. And they started to build a network of bunkers uh, and, and tunnels that led from a bunker to bunker. They dug tunnels and tunnels out underneath the wall to get to the Christian side and obtain arms from the Christian underground. And, uh, and, um, and we had a bunker too. My father was a member of the uh, um, uprising movement. And of course you had to have a secret entrance. Our uh, powder room floor and commode all lifted and we would have to spend who knows how long in that Netherland. Wow, so how did you end up, what ended up happening the day that you got separated from your father and moved? While we were in the bunker, fighting erupted in the streets, uh, facing a 20th century army, uh, armed from head to toe, uh, against armored tr trucks, against tanks, against bomber plane, rose, a, stood up a group, a handful, only a few hundred. They climbed up on rooftops. They stepped out in the streets and lapped Molotov cocktails, and the fighting went on. At some point, a grenade was thrown into our a bunker and we were dragged out. And we were dragged through the, 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 the whole ghetto was engulfed in flames. Buildings were crumbling to our feet uh, and uh, corpses and congealed blood all around us. And we were taken to Umschlagplatz, which is a deportation uh, station loaded onto freight trains, and in the morning we walk up in Majdanek extermination camp where my father was guest. 
how did you stay together? Because when you went to your concentration camp, you were with your sister and your mother. Yes. How did you stay together? Uh, men, women, and children were separated. There were hard, there were no children. There was no sound of children. My uh, my, I was thirteen years old. Children under fourteen were contraband, but I pretended I was fourteen. Part of the reason was that the three of us had a pact that if one of us would be taken uh, to be guest, all three of us would go. My sister was the one that was designated to go, so my mother, sister, and I traded places with two other women, convinced absolutely that we were being taken to the guest chambers, and uh, they put us on a train, and the train took us to Skarżysko, which was also a concentration camp, but there were no crematoria. Our reason for still being alive simply was that the guest chambers could not uh, dispose of everyone that quickly, so we were sort of waylaid there. In Majdanek, the crematorium was right outside the fence, and the chimneys, and the gas, uh, and the and the smoke, the smoke of our people, and uh, and there was even a gallow. As so though things were not gruesome enough to keep us even more frightened, they uh, they uh, our people would just dangle from the gibbets like broken puppets. And you know, I must point out to you that even in Majdanek, and in, in, in this horrible hell that we were in, uh, at night when we came back from our slave labor, we composed songs. That was our way of holding on to our humanity. We had no pencils, we had no paper. It was not to write it for history to remember. It was to nourish our souls, to remember the love, to remember the people we loved, to express our indignation. That was the only thing that was left for us is our humanity. How did you end up getting out of the concentration camp? One night, we hear a rumble of planes. The rumble becomes louder, more persistent, and we say, oh, could it be? After all these years, could it be? And the bombs started to fall, and it was like manna from heaven. We kept on saying, keep on throwing the bombs. We are not afraid to die. To die by, by an allied bomb would be such a dignified death. And you know, the following morning, we were liberated. I have chill bumps literally from head to toe. Your story is so powerful. We're going to come back to your story and find out your transition back into life and coming over to the U.S. But first, we're going to take a look at a museum that is also preserving stories and helping the legacy move on. It is now time for your social sizzle. I'm here with Arielle Weininger from the Holocaust Museum here in Chicago. Welcome. Thanks for having me. So we have you on the social sizzle because you have hundreds of thousands of people come through. Tell us a little bit about the museum. The museum brings in about 100,000 people annually. Um, and 60,000 of those visitors are uh, students. It's important for us that we have that huge number of students because Illinois has a mandate for Holocaust education and we are the prime location in the state of Illinois to satisfy that mandate. If people are coming to the museum, what would they see when they come in? They will see a very large um, historical exhibition about the Holocaust, but also very much driven out of the stories of our survivors. All of the objects that they'll see on display come from our survivor community, and all of the monitors that have information and testimonies from the survivors are local survivors. That is wonderful. Well, you were telling me an awesome story about Estelle a minute ago, yes. about her actually getting a call from the president last year. 
Yeah, we were asked by the city of Chicago and Mayor Rahm Emanuel to put an exhibition up at City Hall about the 70th anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. Out of that, Estelle was, <clears throat> Estelle was included in that exhibition. Out of that, a phone call came to her from the White House that the White House needed an official delegation to go to Warsaw to commemorate the 70th anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, and Estelle got that phone call from the White House. So Estelle does tell her story at the museum, and yes. she has stuff on display. How many other survivors do you have that are involved? We have 72 survivors on the Speakers Bureau. It's the largest in the country outside of the state of Israel. Um, every single school child that comes goes through and has a tour of the museum, and then at the end of that, we'll hear from a survivor. It is an unparalleled educational opportunity for these children. So if people haven't been to the museum, where can they check it out? They can come to the museum. We're located in Skokie, Illinois at 9603 Woods Drive, or they can check out our website and get information there. There are also Holocaust museums throughout the country, of course, the one in Washington, DC, but pretty much in any major town, you're going to have a Holocaust museum and people can get educated there. That is wonderful. Well, thank you so much for coming on The Social Sizzle. Thank you for having me. Tonight, we hear a rumble of planes. The rumble becomes louder, more persistent, and we say, oh, could it be? After all these years, could it be? And the bombs started to fall, and it was like manna from heaven. We kept on saying, keep on throwing the bombs. We are not afraid to die. To die by, by an Allied bomb would be such a dignified death. Well, last time you were on the set, you got us to where you were liberated. Tell us what that was like. Um, it, it most likely was not anything like you are likely to imagine. Um, it, you might think that the gates of heaven opened up and we, we thought, we hoped that it would be so. But you have to remember that this was in January. Poland is quite cold. The ground was covered with snow and ice. And uh, the gates are open and we are shuffling out. All we, it's cold. All we are wearing is a, a, a caftan, no underwear, no stockings, no scarves, wooden clogs. We are covered with lice and mange and lice itch, so we scratched and, uh, um, and we are marching out like that. So they, um, they came outside the fenced in barbed wire fence uh, that was a no man's land. So we are shuffling through there. We have, don't have a penny. We have no home to come back to. And we were also very afraid that this was the front line. What if the Germans come back? So we wanted to move so desperately, so quickly, but it was like our legs were tied. Did you know where you were going? Were you going back home? We had, there was no home. Warsaw was, com the Warsaw Ghetto was completely flattened. There wasn't one building that was left standing. So how did you get to the point from liberation to then deciding that you were gonna move to the United States? We had to escape from the Russian zone to the American sector in, in Germany. We wandered through Poland. We wandered through, uh, through um, Czechoslovakia. In Poland, while we were still wandering, and I'm describing in my book how we uh, found our two cousins, and they were young, and they were healthy, and they were much cleverer than my mother, sister, and I. So at least we did not starve anymore. Did you still live with the fear that you had for all those years? My mother, who was so valiant in the concentration camps, who did the most, most heroic things to keep us alive, when she came here, she just couldn't adjust. Not all, uh, not all survivors 
were able to start life over again. This book, tell us about your book. When did you write it? I wrote this book when I retired from, from uh, teaching. It came out in uh, the end of 2012. Transcending Darkness is the name, and I tell you, that is so your story. You radiate the light, and it has been such a pleasure having you on today's show and sharing your story. You have so much more to tell, and it's in this book, so. Yes, I don't think that suffering has to drive us to despair and destruction, like we hear about the shootings in schools. I think that um, suffering can teach us to love more deeply, to be more compassionate. And coming back to my book, I hope that the readers will be uplifted by the love and courage that shines through human beings, even in the worst times. I love that, and I love that your generation is able to pass down to future generations the stories so the legacy in the past does not repeat itself, but the legacy will live on. Well, thank you so much. It has been wonderful. It's been our pleasure to have you on the set today. Thank you so much, Estelle. Now it's time for the viewer's voice. Today's question is, how do you face or overcome major obstacles and continue to stay positive? As a performer, I always find that staying positive is a key in how I get through daily life um, and progress as a songwriter or vocalist. Uh, I always try and have a really positive support system behind me and, and always keep what I love in the back of my head so that um, I can keep going and uh, keep learning and stay positive. Uh, I'm usually a positive person because I always feel like, you know, being down is not going to help me. So normally if I have an obstacle and it's really bringing me down, I always go to my support team, what I call them. Like, you know, my new best friends, uh, my siblings are like uh, best friends to me as well. So normally if I don't have an answer to my obstacle, I always go to them for advice. And I pray a lot as well. Usually I try to look for the, like, the light of the situation. I try to find what is good about the situation I'm in. Like how much time I have left to do a project or to like finish something up. I think it's more or less about having a mix of positivity and negativity to keep yourself kind of realistic. You take things one step at a time and surround yourself with people. I also just tend to um, just do like any hobbies that I enjoy, just to kind of take my mind off of any troubles. And then I'll just focus on stuff that I love and then once I start to like calm down and I realize that like, okay, I can do this, then I get a little bit more positive, plus other people help me stay positive too. Well, in life we are guaranteed to have ups and downs, but it is that that makes our character and helps build it and ultimately shapes our future. For more information on Estelle's journey or on the show, go to WhitneyReynolds.com. The Respiratory Health Association is a proud supporter of The Whitney Reynolds Show, raising funds and awareness for lung disease research and programs. 